the next several weeks, we are going to be talking about the ways in which God can reset us in our lives. And the inspiration behind that comes from a Japanese tradition in which when a piece of pottery or something valuable breaks, they will often uh, mend it together in gold. And when that happens, it's often considered more valuable than before it was broken. And I think we live in a culture in which brokenness is not something that we really understand and know how to deal with. We don't always know how to deal with brokenness in our lives. We don't always know how to deal with brokenness in the world. And sometimes when some of us experience profound brokenness in our lives, we don't know if that means that we're still valuable or not. And so in our conversations this morning and over the next several weeks, part of our conversation will be how God loves us. And how even in our brokenness and even when we feel the most in doubt about who we are, that it is the God's love that binds us together and that it is in being bound by God's love that we can find some of the most profound beauty and joy and hope in our lives. Now this morning I want us to turn to the book of Luke chapter 9. And we're going to actually tackle a pretty hard passage this morning. Jesus is on his way from Samaria. He is making his way to Jerusalem. And we all, some of us remember what happens in Jerusalem when Jesus gets there, right? What happens when Jesus gets to Jerusalem? What happens to him? He's betrayed, arrested, tortured, and killed. And he's just leaving Samaria where he was rejected and turned away. And the reason I tell you that is because in our culture, whenever we think of faith, often when we look to Jesus, we want Jesus to rescue us from pain. We want Jesus to save us from having to deal with the hard and difficult situations in life. We want Jesus to raise up the valleys and to lower the mountains and to make things even for us. And what I want to tell you this morning is, is that sometimes when we follow Jesus, it doesn't always make life easier. Sometimes following Jesus can make life harder. And sometimes the things that our culture struggles with most, failure, brokenness, pain, are sometimes the parts of the journey that Jesus needs to lead us through to get to the most profound beauty, the greatest sense of wholeness, and what true abundance can be like in our lives. So Jesus is making this journey from Samaria to Jerusalem, and along the way, there are three kind of would-be disciples who commit to following him. And I want you to listen as they make their commitment, as Jesus responds, and I want you to sense how you feel and react to that. So Luke chapter 9, we're going to read verses 57 through 62. 57 through 62. I didn't tell you that because I didn't want you to jump ahead. Because I know I've got my A-plus students in here this morning. Hear the word of God. As Jesus and his disciples traveled along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and the birds in the sky have nests, but the human one has no place to lay his head. Then Jesus said to someone else, Follow me. And he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of God's kingdom. Someone else said to Jesus, I will follow you. Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those in my house. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, for the opportunity to be here in your presence. God, thank you for waking us up to experience life today to enjoy the gift of what it means to breathe and to live and to live in a relationship with one another and to live in a relationship with you. God, guide us through your scriptures this morning and God, may your truth illumine our lives. May we draw closer to you and may we have a sense of peace. 
But we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a world today that I think is in the midst of a spiritual crisis. I think many people would, would, would say the exact same thing. You know, when we look at our politics, when we look at our country, when we look at the world, even when we look at our own community and we look at what's happening within our own borders and within our own families, I think many of us would say, you know, we're living at a time in which there is a spiritual crisis and there's, there's a struggle to have a depth in our spirituality. And I agreed with you. And I would agree with you. And so many times when I look around me, that's what I see. And yet this week, somebody challenged me on it. And I don't like to be challenged. There's this defiant part of me that just doesn't like that. But what they said is, they said, Chris, what I challenge you to see when you look out into the world and you name all the struggles you see and the spiritual deficit that you talk about, I want you to understand that that's probably a mirror of you. Now, what that meant to me was, when I look out in the world and I want to blame everybody else and I want to talk about all the problems in the world and I want to look at all these things, what it tells me is that probably what, what's, what's happening is a reflection of probably what's going on in my own heart. That there's probably still a lot of spiritual work that I need to do and that the people that are elected, the people that are leading are people that I've been a part of choosing and that if I'm going to claim and name a spiritual deficit in our country and in our world and in our community and in, and in this place, I probably need to own that I've contributed to that. And that probably comes from the fact that I need to do some serious spiritual work of my own. But how do you do that spiritual work? Pastor, how do we do that in the world in which we live? How do we do and dig deeper into this relationship with Jesus in such a way that allows us to grow deeper and to experience life in a deeper and richer way and to know who we are? And what I have to tell you is, is in order to do that, you have to let go. You have to surrender. The only way that we can grow in our relationship with God, the only way that we can grow in faith and in grace, the only way that we can experience what it means to trust and to allow God to move and reshape us is to let go and let God. It's to every day get up and to lay our lives, every part of our lives, at the foot of the cross and go, God, it's not about me, this is about you. And every day that we get up and we lay everything at the foot of the cross, we surrender our will, we surrender whatever outcomes we may be after to the will of God, then God is able to move and do the work within us and around us to be able to shape us into the people that he has created us to be and can truly transform our world one life at a time. Many of us this morning are looking for something to change in our lives and we keep waiting for something on the outside to change so things will get better. And what I found consistently over and over again is that the greatest amount of progress, the greatest amount of depth, the greatest amount of growth in life isn't whenever I'm waiting for other things to change, but whenever I ask God to do the work of change within me. You see, I have a very clear idea about what I think other people ought to do to make my life better. Do you? If I asked you and listed down names right now, could you list off all the people in your life that would make your life better if they would just do these things? Yet the greatest struggle for me, maybe not for you, I'm a blunt instrument sometimes, I get it, is I'm not always clear about what I need to be doing how I need to be growing. I'm not always clear about what I'm not letting go of. I'm not always able to see clearly the struggles I'm having in my own life. And so it's hard for me to really deal with change. It's hard for me to deal with growth. It's hard for me to see beyond the horizon because I'm so bought into where I am. And I can give everybody a litany and a list of everything that they ought to do, but I struggle because it's hard for me to see the work that I need to be doing. So when Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem, when he's on this road to, to what God has in store for him, these disciples, these would-be people come along the way, and he says, listen, I'll follow you. And Jesus says, I hope you understand that if you say that you will follow me, I don't have a house. I don't have a place to lay my head. I go where God tells me to go, and I trust that God will provide. 
Another one says, listen, I will go with you anywhere, and, but just let me go back and, and bury the dead. Let me take care of all of the obligations to my family and to my culture and to what I have to do, and then I'll be ready to go. And Jesus says, listen, if you're going to follow me, you've got to put me first. The only way you're going to find freedom and peace in your life isn't by doing more, isn't by trying to, be, to deal with your obligations more. It's by trusting me and trusting that I will lead you and I will take you where you need to go. Another one says, Jesus, I will go with you. And he says, but listen, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And he says, listen, you can't live your life looking backwards. If you're going to follow me, then keep your eyes on me. That's where your hope is. You know, we live in a world that's driven by ego. In our community and in our culture, you are what you do, you are what you have, and you are what people say about you. And whenever I sit down and I talk to people through some of the most critical times of their lives, these three things consistently come up. Pastor, I've lost my job. Pastor, I've retired. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know if I should come to church. I don't know if I can go be around my friends because what I've done for so long, I'm no longer doing, and I don't know what to think about myself. We are what we have. Pastor, I just don't, I don't know. We're having to downsize and make changes, and this isn't the life that I dreamt that we would have. This isn't what I've been working so hard for. This isn't the way I thought that things were going to play out. And yet we have this sense that if, if we don't have enough or if we don't have certain things, that we're not valuable and worthwhile. That there's not something intrinsically valuable about who we are. So we have to dress ourselves up. We have to build our lives around us. And we have to make sure that we have enough in the bank for security. One of my dear friends in 2008 was in the investment world. And he aligned himself so closely with his resources that when the stock market dropped, he took his own life. He could not see past what he had. He could not see and understand his own value besides what was or was not in his bank account. And because that dictated his sense of success and failure, he thought he failed as a person. And we are what people say about us. Oh my gosh. Sometimes when I counsel, I sit with people who are so concerned what other people are saying. They're so concerned about the word on the street. They're so concerned. And I've been there. Trust me. I remember, I've been in a place where my ego was so concerned about what everybody was saying. And what was it, up or down? I felt like I was in politics. You know, what does the poll say? And what I learned is that what other people say is not near as important as what Jesus says about me. That I can't control what other people say. I can't even control what other people think. I can barely control what I think. But when I read the scriptures and I learn what Jesus says, I can trust in that. I can live in that. And not only can I live in that, but I can thrive in that. I can thrive in that place of what God says and surrendering my life to God. You know, it's amazing how important it is to put our lives in perspective. Because what happens if you can't do anymore? Then you're not. If you can't have anymore, what value do you have? If you don't know, if you're so concerned about what other people say about you, then, then your life is just going to be up in the wind. And God doesn't want that. The other issue that we struggle with in our culture, I'm going to say a really hard word today, is entitlement. That's a big issue. That gets, in, that gets in the way of our relationship with God. What we're entitled to, what we think we deserve. There's this, somebody told me this great story. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I really understand it, but when I say the story, people laugh uncomfortably about it. So I think it resonates on some level. So we're going to try that today. So a mom and a son are walking along the beach. And as they're walking along a beach, a wave comes and sweeps her son away like that. And she's distraught, like out of control. She falls on her knees and she is praying, God, please give me my son back. Give me my son back. God, what has happened? And after 
after praying and praying and praying, the water brings her son back and puts him right there on the shore. And she puts her face in her hands and she takes this big sigh and she looks up to the heavens and she says to God, what about the hat he was wearing? You see what I mean? How many of us live lives of entitlement? How many of us trust and surrender to who God has called us to be and how God has called us to live? And, and to be able to live in that place, understanding that following God will take us through some difficult times. Following God will lead us through some times in which we'll be challenged, in which our egos will be challenged, our identities will be challenged, our values will be challenged. Suzanne Stabile, who teaches the Enneagram, who's somebody that some of us have taken and seen in class and some of us are going to go see, and who that says, quotes someone, and I can't remember who it is, but it speaks so much to me. And she says, success after the age of 35 only has so much to teach us. That success after the age of, five, age of 35 only has so much that it can teach us. But when life gets tough, when we experience setbacks and failures, when our, whenever our core is challenged by all that we've built our life and our understanding on, God is able to teach us new things. God is able to, to rearrange and to reshape and reform and, and renew us in a different way. And when we call out to follow Jesus, we're able to lay everything at the foot of the cross and trust that, that if things change and our assets fluctuate, that God's love never does. That if we get into a place and our jobs change and we're no longer able to physically or mentally do what we once did and loved to do, that God doesn't think any less of us and God doesn't abandon us. And that if there comes a point when public opinion may shift or change in your spheres of influence, God's love never shifts and changes. And that what God says about you is written upon his heart and your heart for eternity. That even in the broken places when God brings you together, it is God's grace that binds you. And it is possible, it is probable, it is true that sometimes in the deepest and hardest places, God's beauty shines in a different way. I went on a mission trip one time. And when I went on the mission trip, we were going to serve communion. And we had taken some youth who were along the way, and they had packed up all the gear. And when they packed up all the gear, they packed up the chalice and the plate for communion, and they put it all in the stuff, and they, they put it in the back of the van. Well, that's what they told me. They really threw it in the back of the van. And then they stacked all the luggage on top of it and put all those things around it. And, and they brought it out. And then when they brought it in, it was broken. And it was given to me by a dear friend who had passed away with cancer. And whenever they had broken it, I was distraught about it. I was upset about it. And they took it away, and they knew and could see in my face that I, I could not. It was just so overwhelming what had happened. And all night long, they took and glued that chalice and that plate back together. Now, I want to tell you something. That plate and that chalice were beautiful before. But when they brought it out for that evening, for the last evening when we served communion, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Because in their love, they glued that all back together. What I want you to hear this morning is that God loves you is that whenever you surrender to God and place God at the, at the very highest part of your life and you live your family's life, your work life, your business, your own personal relationship you have with yourself, when you put everything under the Lordship of Christ, when you surrender everything and put it under God, God is able to take even the hardest and most broken places and to make them beautiful. That God is able to reset your life in ways that right now you cannot even imagine. All you can see is the pain. All you can know is how hard it's going 
going to be and that it's not going to be like it was before. But I promise you that if you will trust God, if you will hand it over to God, it may not be like it ever was before, but it will be beautiful and it will be good. And it will be valuable. The greatest and deepest places that God wants to work are in the hardest and darkest places of your heart. Someone once said that Jesus does his greatest work in a graveyard. Right now, there are places in your life that you think are dead and gone. There are places in your life that are, you think right now are beyond redemption. There are places in your life that you believe that God's grace cannot mend and bind. And you believe that only through your efforts, only through working harder, only through amassing more, only through trying to get people to like you can you get to where God wants you to be. Only through your success will people be able to accept you. Only through your image and reputation will people be able to honor you. And I want to tell you the truth. At the end of the day, it all passes away, but God's love. It all passes away. We come into the world with no thing, and we leave this world with no thing. The only thing that is constant is God's grace. When you come to the table today, and you prepare to receive the bread and the cup, I want you to be willing to set aside and to put at the foot of the cross all that you bring today. Maybe it's the first step. Maybe it's just one thing that you bring. And I want you to allow and to trust that God will work you through that. That this table that God has prepared for you, a table that exists all over the world today, is a table of hope. It's a table of redemption. It's a table of forgiveness. It's a table of mercy. And it's a table for you and me. Let us pray. God, we come to you this morning giving you thanks for all of the love that you pour out for us. And God, yes, we confess that often, God, we identify so strongly with what we do and what we have and what people say about us and what we think we're entitled to. And God, those things stand as roadblocks often for us to experience the true grace and acceptance that you offer us through Jesus Christ. So this morning, God, we lay down at the foot of your cross the fruits of our labors, all that we have done and all that we do not do and are not able to do anymore. We lay at the foot of the cross all that we have amassed and even for some of us, all that we have lost. God, we lay at the foot of your cross, God, all of our concern about our reputation and our image. God, all the people that esteem us and all that lifts us up. And God, even those things and those, those people and the sayings and the ideas that God seemed to tear us down, we lay at the foot of your cross, God. This morning, God, we lay at the foot of the cross those things that we think we're entitled to, all that we know and believe that we deserve that has been taken from us, all that we believe should and ought to be laid at our footstep, at our feet, God, we lay at yours. Because, God, true freedom comes in you. True freedom comes in trusting you and surrendering to you. True freedom and spiritual growth comes with the freedom that letting go and letting God allows us to experience. As we open our hands and receive the elements, allow us to receive your love. Allow us to receive your grace. And allow us to take a step closer to you this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.